If you turn now to the third chapter of the second letter to the church at Thessalonica, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, the final chapter, our final two studies. And Paul is now going to give some final words. He's going to give that last little bit of instruction. He writes the first letter. There were some issues there regarding the rapture, the return of the Lord. He squares those away, uh, speaks a little more to those details in the second letter. And he's now working in that area of practical application. In other words, what do we do with these things that we now uh, know to be true? And he's going to begin uh, really with a, with a look at stability because we are, as I said last Sunday, often tempted to be a little bit like jello. We kind of wiggle, we kind of move, we kind of, when pressure comes, we uh, are pushed away sometimes by that pressure. And so he's going to give us some keys here in these final verses on how to live victorious lives, and he'll do so by beginning and asking for prayer for himself and for his team. Don't be afraid to ask for prayer. I think sometimes we have not, exactly as James wrote, because we ask not. We, we're not in contact with the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lord of hosts, the glorious God of heaven. Uh, and so we try and do things on our own, and more importantly, we don't entertain others getting engaged uh, with us so that they can ask for those things for us as well. Paul begins by asking for prayer. And while Paul begins that way, we shall as well. Would you pray with me as we take this final chapter to the Lord? Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for this beautiful congregation. Lord, these amazing saints that have come to hear from heaven. Lord, not from my lips, but from yours. And pray that you would just use your word now to strengthen, encourage, and bless us as we study it together. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Finally, brethren, so he's beginning now the actual conclusion, uh, really to both letters to the church at Thessalonica. He's giving those final tidbits of instruction as he, as he would speak to this church. Now I want to remind you, because the, the setting is important, Paul is writing from the city of Corinth in southern Greece, all the way down on the edge of the Mediterranean, it was known at that time uh, pretty much like Sin City, if you would. It was a very carnal place, so much so that people who were from Corinth uh, were generally believed to be a little bit worse than everyone else in the area of flesh and debauchery. And in fact, if you were not from there, but you lived a life that was kind of out there, you were said to be Corinthized. In other words, it had a bad reputation. And so Paul's writing these words of encouragement from a place that would be pretty tough to write words of encouragement because he was immersed in a culture that was anti-God. We're immersed in a culture that's anti-God, amen? It's not easy to live the Christian life. We were last night, uh, many of us from the church with the men's ministry, but we had all the family and we were at the Dodger game. Go Blue, we won again. Uh, we are killing it right now. But we're, we're, at the, we're at the baseball game and I, I'm sitting there and there's this whole, group, there's this whole section. And I'm listening to some of the conversations behind us and the people are going, don't go down there. They're like crazy church people. And they'd bring their beers, they're kind of holding their beers inside of their, you know, underneath their jersey, their Kershaw jersey, trying to hide it so we don't see them, you know. We're all talking about all kinds of cool stuff. We got scripture on shirts, and I, we were just telling them, we we're kind of proving the point. Look, you don't have to be drunk to enjoy baseball. That's the world we live in. We're supposed to be salt and supposed to be light. When we go places, we're supposed to be different than everybody else. We're supposed to show them what it means to live out our faith. It was a joy to be able to do that last night. But that's our goal, that's our task every day. And Paul now is going to introduce some things that can help us uh, do that very effectively. He says, finally, brethren, pray for us 
that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. He says, look, the purpose that we're still here for you, for me, for us as a church, the purpose of this church is to do two primary things. One is to offer the gospel so that people can be saved, and two is to offer the word so that they can grow. That's really what church is about. This is not a social club where we all get together and talk about certain political points of view that one might say are more conservative or less conservative. It is to preach the gospel and to teach the word. That's what church is for. And Paul's reminding, he says, look, you need to do that. Time is of the essence. We need to run the race. And we need to run swiftly in that race. People around you are perishing. Our world is absolutely going sideways. Now, praise God, we have an opportunity to affect change in that world that's upside down. We can make it and help make it right side up. But we have to run to that. We must do it now. Time, in essence, is of the essence. We, we, don't, we can't wait around. So I was sharing with, with First Service, can you imagine if there were such a thing, and I want to be very careful here, I do not believe in aliens, okay? But if there were aliens, because surely someone will watch this, well, he said he believes in aliens. But if there were such a thing, they're out in some, you know, planet Necron in the outer reaches of our galaxy, and yes, I made that name up. <laughs> but there they are on their own little planet, and they come here. What would they know from watching our society? What would they think about humankind? Let me tell you what they would think. We're absolutely obsessed with sex. We believe that if you drink beer all day long, somehow you will get wealthy, wise, and have beautiful girlfriends and or boyfriends. They'll think that everyone here must have jillions of dollars, that we all have the finest things in life. They're not really going to get a whole lot of concern for the Creator from watching what goes on on TV, in our society. We are supposed to be the counter to that. We're supposed to be those people that tell the whole universe swiftly about the good news of the gospel and the glorious God who loves us. We're supposed to do that through the word. The Thessalonians were like that. It goes on in verse 2 and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. You see, there are a lot of people professing faith that don't actually have faith at all. They have religion. They have church. They have certain ways of doing things. But it's not faith that drives them, and it certainly is not the gospel. It's not the word of God. It, it may be what one could call a religious business model. This is how we do this. This is how we make money. Some of the wealthiest people on the planet right now are actually people who pastor very large churches that no longer preach the gospel or teach the word. That is extremely sad. And God is going to hold them accountable to that because what I've been called to do is preach the gospel and teach the word. You, you see, that's what every pastor is supposed to be doing. And so Paul begins by asking for prayer that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and that the word itself might be glorified. Here in this church, we glorify the word of God because it's truth and it's transformative. It will change people's lives. My stories, my little things, that I, I'm only attempting to draw attention to the principle in the word, but it is the word of God that changes lives. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. You see, we want to put forth the Word of God swiftly because time is short. People are perishing. The, the world has, think on this for a second, because in the beginning God, I want to encourage you, come out on Sunday nights. We're doing a series on the creation. But if you begin in the beginning God, 
then you also believe that there is an end to what he has created. This world has a date stamp on it, and Jesus is coming again. So if you believe that, there should be an air of urgency to your life as lived for Christ. You should be running swiftly with the truth of the Word of God. Wherever you go, everything you do. So he says that the Word would go quickly and that it would be glorified, that it would be exalted, that the Word of God would be lifted up. We want people to know what the Word of God says. One of the reasons we focus the way we do on the Word of God, you go on our website, there are hundreds of Bible studies on there. You can watch videos and download slides and do all those things. It's not about me, it's about God's Word. We simply want that Word to go out, people to hear it. That should be our focus, and we can't lose that focus. The Great Commission is not go make churches of all nations. The Great Commission is go make disciples of all nations. The first step of which is seeing people come to faith in Christ and then growing in the likeness of Christ as a disciple, a follower of Jesus. We need to keep that the primary thing. That's why we're actually here. Now there's lots of other things that will be affected when you're a follower of Christ. Because the Word of God is supposed to govern how we live, amen? That's why he says the word should be glorified. You see what will happen when someone becomes a believer and then the word is taught, the word is preached, the word is given out, then people take in the word and go, you know what, I'm kind of doing this backwards. I got this marriage thing messed up. I, I really ought to give up that behavior because scripture says that it's actually an affront to God. You see, the word does that. Social change, while noble in its endeavor, can't happen unless the heart is changed. It is the heart of man that's deceitful and desperately wicked, and who can know it? It's not that we don't have adequate programs. It's that we are not seeing people's lives transform, and consequently the internal problem remains in place. That's the issue. That doesn't mean that social things shouldn't be done, shouldn't be tried. It simply says there's a deeper issue, and that deeper issue is the heart of man. We need to go after the heart of man with the gospel and with the good news of the Word of God. But you know what? That's a risky race. It is absolutely uh, it's going to cause you some problems when you begin to share the gospel. When you take the word, you start speaking about it, people are going to go, well, you know, oh, you're one of those, a Bible person. Yeah, I'm a Bible person. That's what I think God's called me to do. That's what we should all be. We should be Bible people. We preach the gospel. We share the Bible. You come in for counseling at this church, we're not going to talk about the psychological things that are wrong with you. We're going to talk about how your life matches up to the Word of God. Because that's truth. And again, that's not anti-psychology. That's simply saying we deal with truth here. And that truth comes from the Word of God. Not man's opinion about what's right or wrong. Ask 10 people their opinion about what's right or wrong. You're going to get 20 answers. At least. Maybe more. You see, we live in a hard place, and hard places are not easily won. Paul was in a hard place. He was in Corinth. He was in Greece. He was in a, he was in a city that idealized many of the same things that our society idealizes today. And they're not good. They can't help. They can destroy, and very often do. And so Paul is saying, look, let's, let's get into this risky race and let's run it. We're, we're in the world's sensual playground, just like he was. We live in that type of environment as well. And the opposition to the gospel is real in your life, just like it was real in his life. Don't think that it's not. There is a real enemy. His name is Satan. He has millions if not billions of demons and they are quite capable of harassing you and they will 
Get ready for it. Here's the good news. Greater is he who's in you than he who's in this world. So you rest and trust in Jesus. You put on the full armor of God and then get ready to fight. Now, I don't know how many of you actually like a good challenge. I happen to like a good challenge. I'm one of those people. Tell me it can't be done. That's my cue. Okay. I'm just weird that way. But spiritually, we all need to be that way. Because the fact of the matter is, people are going to spend eternity in hell if we don't offer them the truth of the gospel. So let's make sure that we take that seriously. It's a challenge. You probably have some challenging people in your life. Amen? Got some people that don't want to hear the gospel? Got some people that don't believe the word of God's true? It's going to be a challenge, and they're going to get fed a lie. If you're currently, if you have children in public school, and this is not bashing public school, I happen to believe that we need Christians in every area of education, including public school. But I guarantee you, when they get to college, college professors are going to try and tell them that there is no God. And they're going to do it through the theory of evolution, through secular humanism. And you need to know the truth. That truth comes from the Word of God. You can either believe what it says or not. And if you believe it, then you need to teach it. You need to tell people the truth. It's a risky race. You're going to have to risk looking like a fool. Exactly as Paul said, I am out of my mind for the sake of Christ. Yep. To the person who's perishing, the gospel is foolishness. But to him who's being saved, it is the gospel of God unto salvation. Don't back away from that. Don't give in. Get in the risky race and run it. Unfortunately, verse 2 reminds us that very often some of our strictest and and, and most stringent uh, opposition comes from within. Notice what verse 2 says. We may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. You're going to face opposition from people who claim to be Christians. Well, you're not doing church right. It needs to look like this. You're going to have on one side, you're going to have the libertines, and on the other side, you're going to have the legalists. And the legalists are going to be going, well, you're not, you know, you're just not hammering sin enough. So every week there in that church, you're going to get hellfire, brimstone, death burning, and you're just going to die. And on the other side... Well, can't we all just love each other? You know, God is love. Now, here's the crazy part. There's such a thing as hellfire and brimstone, and God absolutely does love everybody. But somewhere in the middle is where those two concepts meet. You, you see, an inside job is like this. you got the person who's illegal and says, go, we're not tough enough on sin. And then you got the libertine person who's engaged in active sin, who's like, well, you know, could you just lighten up? I mean, after all, I, I mean, I've been fornicating a long time. I've had people say those types of things to me. Look me right in the eye. Well, you can't tell me I don't love, I, well, I'm not telling you you don't love that person. I'm telling you that you're supposed to be married. If you claim to be a Christian, And by the way, that's not me that said that. Read Galatians 5, Galatians 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Romans chapter 1. You tell me. Am I wrong or am I right? Well, yeah, it says that, but, you know, that's just your... No, it's not my interpretation. It says, and such were some of you. That means you're supposed to be washed up, has been sinners, not actively engaged and really good at it. You see, from the inside, people will, well, you know. I mean, come on, lighten up. I was talking with one of my sons, and we were kind of joking back and forth, and he was reminding of, of a class that he took in Bible college, and, and it's so true what he said. He says, you know, there are times when I'm a complete Calvinist. 
Grace of God all the way, God's sovereign plans. And there's times when I'm an Arminian. It's like, man, you're going to hell. And then I land in the middle. You know, there are people that need to hear about the grace of God and the love of God. And you need to know that they need to hear about the grace of God and the love of God. But there are also people over here that need to be told that, look, you're in sin. And if you don't flee that sin, how can you say that you've repented? If you haven't repented, how can you ask for forgiveness for something that you stay in? You see, both are true. So be careful, because from within, you're going to get accused one side versus the other. Don't let them move you. As Paul begins to put forth the the remainder of these, these verses, he says, look, but the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. As the evil one comes against you, there's three principal things that Paul is praying for in our lives, and they're very simple. We need to be established. We need to be strengthened. We need to be built up. That's hopefully, prayerfully, what we're doing right now. We're doing that corporately by studying the Word of God. He says, I want you to be established. I want you to be made well, made whole, fixed up. I don't want you to be moved. I want you to be strengthened in your position. The Lord is faithful. Because God's going to guard your heart. He's going to take care of that attack from the evil one if you're willing to be established. You see, part of the problem is we don't actually work very hard at being established sometimes. So we give ourselves over to be open to hearing falsehood. Well, that suits the way I live, so I'm going to agree with that group of people. You can find any sinful behavior, pick it. It doesn't matter which one it is. Pick a sinful behavior and you can start a club of Christians who are engaged in that particular behavior who will all agree with you it's okay. That's a fact. You can start a church where, well, you know, we just believe it's okay to do this particular behavior. And name it. We are the first church of liars. You'll find people to join your club. you get people, who, well, you know, I mean, I've told the truth my whole life. It's gotten me nothing but a black eye. It's gotten me beat up. I've gotten all these things wrong. Every, so I just started telling lies. My life got better. So from the circumstantial evidence, God's word is not true. Because one of the very last things that's in there is all liars will not inherit the kingdom of God. Ow! You see, so we're supposed to be people of the truth. God is faithful to his word. We just simply need to do it. The second thing, he says, look, I want you to direct your hearts towards the love of God. You see, you have to be truthful, but you have to have that truth in love, exactly what Ephesians 4 says. Speak the truth in love. Don't just beat people up with the truth. Give them the truth, and then give them the solution to the things they might be struggling with. That God does love them but God loves them enough to want to change them. That they can be transformed by the renewing of their mind. See, sometimes we just give people the bad news and we forget to give them the good news. And sometimes we give them the good news, but we forget to tell them that the other side of that is you really actually need to change. Can we please land in the middle? That faithful God is faithful to confront sin and he's also faithful to offer the gospel as the answer. So let's rest in that truth. God is forever faithful. He wants to build that character of Christ in us. Scripture is replete with those admonitions. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says, God is faithful even when we are faithless. So his faithfulness is not dependent on your faithfulness. His faithfulness is always there even when we are unfaithful. So you can rest and trust in him. God is forever faithful. Paul's going to wrap up these first few verses by speaking about something. Can I just tell you, I hate church discipline. I personally hate church discipline. I don't like confronting problems. I really don't. But can I also tell you it's part of my job description? 
Because when you know the truth, you have to live the truth, otherwise the truth becomes untruth. Because somebody will believe what you do over what you say. And so he picks up, and he says this. He, he, he's speaking now to the heart of an issue because he says, look, I want you to direct your hearts towards the love of God and to the patience of Christ. But we commanded you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 6, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, not according to the tr tradition which you receive from us. Ouch! You see, when you first read that, that's going to be a really small church. If what we're talking about is sinless perfection. If what we're talking about is you get out your sinometers and walk around church. Wow, this section over here is, that's, it's, whoa, that's really going up. <laughs> you see, he's not talking about wandering around the church trying to figure out who's got what problem and then confronting it. He's talking about when you personally hear about something that's going on in someone's life, that you're supposed to go address that in a biblical manner so that they can be restored to fellowship first with God and then with people. But we run with verses like this, well, we're supposed to kick out the, the brother, the sister. Look, if that was true, most churches would have two people in them. That would be the church secretary, because she actually does all the work, You didn't like that? It's true. Inside the front office, so much goes on there that you never see, and you're all beneficiaries of it. But you see, there, there would be a handful of people that would meet that criteria, that standard of sinless perfection. None of us would meet that if that's what this was actually talking about. You're all going to fail at that. So it's not talking about just simply dealing with every single thing in a legalistic way, because on one hand, you've got the legalists. On the other hand, you have the libertines. On one hand, there is no, you know, this group over here saying like, well, you know, we're just going to be perfect. The only people that are going to be in that church are going to be so absolutely horrible to be around that there will be no love left in their life, because it will all be about sinless perfection. The other side, you're going to have people, they're going to be super loving, but you're just going to be doing everything that God tells you not to do. Neither one of those positions are correct. And so he says, look, you're supposed to withdraw from somebody who's walking disorderly, not according to the tradition, in this case, the Word of God. So when somebody's life doesn't match up to the Word of God for the purpose of restoring them, not destroying them, you say, look, if you're going to continue this way, then you and I can't fellowship together. And I want you to be really clear here. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 gives us a very specific example. And it says, It is not that I am telling you to withdraw from people who are in the world, but rather brothers and sisters, people who name the name of Jesus and then refuse to live lives that match up with the Word of God. Because if we withdrew from people who were simply in need of the Savior, no one would ever hear the gospel. So it's talking about people in your life or my life that their words don't match what they supposedly believe. Their actions don't match what they supposedly believe. They're living in open, disorderly rebellion to the Word of God. Withdraw from them. Step aside for a time and say, look, you need to get this squared away with God because this is an issue of leaven. It's going to affect the whole church. You, you can't have sin-filled renegades in the church and expect the church to be healthy. So you have to say, look, not on my watch. You can't, you can't live in those things which we've been freed from and then claim the grace of God. But do that, please, lovingly. Do that, Galatians 6.1. Make sure that you're as assuming the role uh, of your own weakness is right in the middle of it saying, I don't want to be guilty of pointing out someone else's splinter while I've got a log hanging out of my face. I, I, I don't want to speak to that person's issue of sin in their life and then realize that I'm quite capable of sinning too and not acknowledging that. 
You see, too many people, when they confront problems in someone else's life, they've got them in their own life, and they won't yield to the fact that they have them. And so that person automatically says, well, I, I can't receive from you because you've got this going on in your life. You live a holy life and confront people, if you need to, in love. But the purpose, according to Matthew 18, of all confrontation of sin is between you and that brother, you and that sister, so that they might be restored. It's not so they can be punished. Punishment is not in view. Restoration is in view. So if ever you lose a heart of restoration, you do not have the heart of Christ. Did you hear me? If you lose the heart of restoration, you do not have the heart of Christ. If you're simply angry at what happened, if you're simply mad about the sin, and you lose the love, then you do not have the heart of Christ. You need to have the heart of Christ. You go that extra mile, you love on that person, you confront those issues in their life, and you say, let me help you through this situation. And you be there for them. You may need to withdraw in fellowship, but you can still be that voice on the other end of the phone that says, look, if you need me, I'm here. But I'm not going to help you engage in destroying your life. So you withdraw yourself. He basically ends this way. He says, look, we need to be an example to follow. People should be able to look at your life, look at my life. For you yourselves, verse 7 says, you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you. You see, Paul could point at his own life. He could point at his team's life. He could look at those that were helping him in ministry and say, if you want to see how this gets done, follow Timothy. Follow my example. Those things in my own life. Paul used to be a fierce opposition to the church on the road to Damascus. He's getting ready to go kill Christians. That's when he found Jesus. So he knew what it was like to be sinful. He knew what it was like to be possessed of a wrong goal. And he said, look, I, I, I want you to understand something. In this is the love of God manifest towards us that while we were yet sinning, Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus died for you, died for me, while I was still actively in opposition to him. Make sure people understand that. Make sure that when you're dealing with people's tender hearts, that at the end, there's an offer of help. Don't just confront. Offer the good news that you can be healed and restored and built up. Yes, you have to repent. Yes, you must turn from those things. Yes, those things are wrong. But let me tell you the good news. You see, a lot of people tell the bad news and forget to give the good news. The good news is Jesus loves you. He died for you. So make sure you end on that note, even if you have to tell something very difficult to that disorderly person, that person who's out of rank. It's a military term. And by the way, it's really an interesting word that is used to, that you're supposed to withdraw. It is actually, the English word is better to, to furl. It's a sailing term. It means to wrap up the sails. We're not going to go anywhere until we get this squared away. We're going to pull in the mainsail. We're going to pull in the jib, and we're just going to sit here. We're not putting out any sail until this gets squared away. That's what we do. We say, look, I'm just going to sit here. You're going to have to deal with my face looking at you and talking to you and telling you about the love of Jesus and that you need to really stop this. That's not someone who hates that person. That's someone who loves that person. And someone who's willing to say, look, I, I can't go have fun with you while your life is falling apart. That type of withdrawing from them. I'm not going to pretend that there's nothing going on. I'm going to tell you that there is something going on. And, and we can't really fellowship until you deal with that thing before God. And he closes by saying, Lord, do we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be, notice this, a burden to them. You see, when we become so other-centered that we are looking to not be a burden to anyone but be a blessing to everyone, that's very attractive to people. 
They really like that. You can even tell them really tough things and they'll receive it because they know that it's motivated by love, care, concern. And so I pray we do that, that we are that example to follow, that we live others-centered. We don't want to become so soft that we don't say that something that needs to change needs to change, but we also don't want to become so rigid and legalistic that we forget that we ourselves are still sinners deeply in need of the grace of God. Deeply. When you take your last breath, you will take your last breath here on this earth as a sinner covered by the grace of God through the blood of Christ on the cross. Amen? Would you stand with me and let's pray? I want to remind you, we have, we have a wonderful prayer team in the prayer room. Maybe you have a need, something in your life that you've been struggling with, and you just need to be prayed that God would deliver you from it. We want to do that. Maybe you don't know the Lord. Maybe you came today and, and you thought church was about religion, and you just heard for the first time, it's not about religion, it's about relationship. The, the gospel is about relationship. It's not about religion. It's not about doing church. It's about being found in him. Prayer team would love to pray with you and share the, the, the good news of the gospel, share the truth of the word, these very things that we've studied this morning. So please avail yourself of that team. As it, they're there for that reason. For the rest of us, as we, as we go our way today, look, let's run with the gospel. Let's run with the word of God and let's go be an effect in our world for the cause of Christ because time is short. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your amazing love. Lord, thank you that while we were actively going the wrong way, uh, you drew us to yourself and you saved us through Jesus. We bless you for the gospel of grace. We thank you for the love. Lord, want to pray for anyone that's struggling this morning. Lord, whatever it is, Lord, would you meet them in that place of, of conflict and confusion. Lord, with the truth of your word, with the power of your loving hand, your gospel. God, help us to flee that which would bind and cling to that which is good. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this beautiful time this morning. Pray that you would bless us as we head out through these doors. Let us run swiftly with the gospel that it might be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.